In the best-selling books, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, Harvard linguist Steven Pinker made the surprisingly controversial case that humanity has been getting richer and less violent over the past two centuries. In Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, and Why It Matters, he argues that our ability to reason and think critically is central to human flourishing and undergirds our phenomenal material and moral progress since the Enlightenment. Pinker explains how important cognitive defects such as the sunk cost fallacy and my side bias cloud our thinking and contribute to intensely polarized tribalistic worldviews that result in the Trumpian rights embrace of QAnon and what he calls university suffocating left-wing monoculture. Not afraid to shy away from controversy, he insists that public policy should be largely driven by facts, not emotion even in heart-wrenching cases such as the police killing of George Floyd. If the goal is to save the largest number of black lives or, or anyone's lives who, who are uh, killed by police, then basing it on a viral video is probably not the, the way to go. Reason talked with Pinker about rationality, social progress, and why despite so much negativity, fear, and anger in the world, he's optimistic about the future. Steven Pinker, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick. So uh, let's start. What's the what's the elevator pitch for rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, and why it matters? Rationality is an introduction to some of the major tools of reasoning that don't necessarily come naturally to us. Logic, probability theory, Bayesian reasoning, correlation and causation, rational choice theory, game theory. It's a exploration of whether and to what extent uh, your typical human is rational, that is, as uh, how well do we measure up against these benchmarks of reasoning? Is an explanation as to why there seems to be such um, rampant uh, insanity in the world, belief in paranormal phenomena and medical quackery and conspiracy theories. Yeah, at one point you referred to it as a pandemic of poppycock. <laughs> yes, so. right. pandemic of poppycock. And then I, uh, I, I take on the, the somewhat paradoxical task of making the case for reason. Paradoxical because unless you already uh, endorse reason as the way that uh, we should believe things, then there are no tools with which to defend reason. But uh, but I do my best. All right, let's start with that. You, you early on you define um, reason or rationality rather as uh, the use of knowledge to attain goals, and you talk about a uh, a, a, a tribe in Africa. Uh, that people, I think, and certainly, you know, maybe 50 years ago or 100 years ago would say, well, these people are primitive, they're not rational, but you kind of show how they employ rationality. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and kind of fill in the definition of rationality that you're using? Yeah, I wanted to push back against the, uh, the, the, the common trope, often appealing to evolutionary psychology a field that I'm quite sympathetic to, that, well, what do you expect if humans, of course, were irrational, we descended from uh, cavemen on the savanna who just you know, chucked spears at, uh, at animals and uh, had to run up a tree if they saw a lion. So we have a, we're just a, nothing but a bundle of, of quick reflexes. Uh, but if you actually look at the lifestyle of people, the people who, who uh, survive in uh, hunter-gatherer existence in the Kalahari Desert, the case mm -hmm. of the sun, who I featured in the first chapter, they are highly cerebral. They've got to, uh, they survive by persistence hunting, which is a uniquely human specialty. It takes advantage of the fact that we are uh, naked, we have no fur, we sweat. So uh, one thing that we can do in the desert that other animals can't is uh, run marathons. Uh, we, we dump heat, we don't uh, get heat stroke. Furry animals do, they're faster than us, but um, uh, if you pursue them long enough, they will keel over. So the trick though is, tracking them because they, they're fast, they, they see a human, they're out of sight, uh, but they leave behind tracks. And the son reason from the tracks to what species of animal was, what its sex is, how, what its condition is, where it's likely to be. Uh, and they do it even though tracks, uh, lots of tracks look alike. Their tracks get eroded by, by, by wind and rain. And, uh, uh, they engage in argumentation. They um, learn, they doubt their first instincts. They don't go with their gut. A young upstart can challenge a, uh, an elder, so they, they don't fall for the uh, fallacy of argument by authority. Um, they distinguish correlation from causation. They engage in Bayesian reasoning. They use a, a lot of the tricks of reasoning. 
which which means that we can't just excuse our own irrationality <laughs> and say, what do you expect from cavemen at a time? Yeah. That uh, uh, reading that section reminded me, uh, I remember I, it was probably in an anthropology class as an undergrad watching a, uh, a film about the Hadza tribe and uh, they would throw a spear at an antelope or something and miss and then they would pick it up and keep walking. And I didn't realize that they were basically just waiting for the antelope to keel over. And uh, that's kind of fascinating to think about. Um, so let's talk about if if rationality is uh, the use of knowledge to attain goals, then um, let's talk about why it seems scarce. You run through um, a series of issues of why we don't seem to be particularly rational. Uh, you know, we're not either we're either not. Is it that we're not goal oriented in all of our activity or that our attempt to get to our goals is confounded by any number of basic uh, kind of logical fallacies? Well, um, there, there's some of each of that, but in the flagrant examples of irrationality have, have captivated people, especially in the last few years, like the conspiracy theories, uh, the, uh, the fake news. There, I, I think it's that the, that the goal that people are pursuing is not the goal that we that got to be second nature, namely establishing objective reality, but rather uh, <clears throat> to boost the um, moral energy of one's own tribe, sect, mm -hmm. coalition, uh, to show what uh, evil, uh, conniving uh, opportunist the other side uh, consists of. Now, it, uh, to achieve glory within your <clears throat> within your clique as a, uh, a formidable warrior for your side. Now, all if if you accept those as goals, then the way that people pursue them could be perfectly rational. If you're the, the, the spreader of the most titillating fake news that make the Democrats look bad, well, by some narrow criterion, you're actually being pretty smart in terms of getting uh, kudos from your own, own side. So you would say somebody, to make it political, you would say somebody like Steve Bannon, and you quote his, uh, his, his uh, idea that he wants to flood the zone with shit. Um, <laughs> I mean, he was... It's irrational, or or he is using, uh, he's spreading irrational ideas, oftentimes conspiracies and just things that are kind of, let's say, you know, challenged by reality. But he was actually pursuing them in a rational way, or he was he was still goal oriented in doing that. He, he got his guy elected, didn't he? Uh, and, and as the, the uh, people who accuse Trump of being um, uh, stupid are are reminded, uh, he did get to be president. So in terms of the, the uh, narrow goal that people set themselves, they can be all too rational. Right. The, what, what I think we often forget, is just so much a part of our background of, of educated, reasonable people. A, a, it is in fact an unusual, exotic, weird conviction, which is that all of our beliefs ought to be aligned with reality. That's the only criterion for believing. Only believe things that are true or that have some claim to being true. Uh, and <clears throat> do your best to find out whether they are true. Now, even saying that, you might say, well, well, well duh, doesn't everyone believe that? And the answer is no. That I, I kind of think of that as a post-enlightenment conviction of some you know, educated intellectual elites. But for most of human history, when it came to uh, <clears throat> really interesting cosmic questions, you couldn't find out any, anyway. There was no true right. false. How could you find out what, what, what's the origin of the universe? How can mm -hmm. you find out what's really going on in uh, discussions among kings and, and dictators and leaders in their uh, private halls of power? Uh, you can't find out, uh, but your beliefs could, they can be entertaining, they could be, they can increase solidarity, uh, they could rile up your side, they could gain you glory. And so that's a, a good enough reason to believe things. And all of us have some residue of that, I should add. Yeah, I mean, you talk about that in um, your discussion of reality versus mythology. So kind of an interesting bracket is that, it, you know, if if we're seeking truth and at some point uh, you, you quote Philip K. Dick saying reality is that which when you stop believing in it doesn't go away. That's actually not what we're not always interested in that. Right. We we are interested in some kind of symbolic identification or, or a secret world where we get to believe certain things, whether it's true or not. Exactly. And even among intellectual elites, there are elements of that, such as religious belief. Uh, I mentioned that the when Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Dan Bennett published their atheist manifestos, there was a furious response, not just from 
the evangelists, uh, but from fellow intellectuals who said it's just kind of uncouth or, or just not done to consider God's existence a matter of truth or falsity. It's not like he came back and they said, well, here are our 36 reasons to believe that God does exist. It's like, how dare you even take that proposition and hold it up to uh, scientific scrutiny? And national myths are, are, are kind of like that. The, uh, they, they are, 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 are fearless founders. Historical fiction, does anyone really care whether Henry V uh, actually gave that speech that, that Shakespeare attributed to him or, or the events in the crown? Well, people do though, right? But, but they're arguing over kind of dueling mythologies rather than whether or not this is historical reality. They don't, I mean, you know, there's some people who, you, who want to get to the bottom of it, the, the fact checkers, the Snopes, <laughs> but they're sometimes considered a little kind of pedantic, like, you know, who really cares what they, whether they said it or not? It's great dialogue. Can I just, uh, to kind of dilate on that a little bit, um, but, you know, with Henry V, say, the, uh, you know, St. Crispin's Day speech, to the extent that that later gets used by actual British politicians, you know, people like Winston Churchill, to either rally the troops or, you know, maybe in a more sinister way to attack bad people uh, or to attack people with uh, under bad motivation, that kind of crosses into where myth starts to create a reality of its own. Indeed. I mean, and we are storytelling animals. We, we live by our beliefs, by our, by our myths. So yes, they become a they do become a reality, a different reality, the reality of the national mythology as, the, as opposed to the reality of what actually happened. So let's talk about some of the, uh, the common uh, mistakes or things that block our rationality. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, I, I think everybody, this book is arguably your most challenging ever because you have a series, you present a number of logic problems or rational, rationality tests. And I think everybody's going to lie and say, oh, you know, I got them all right, or I got 90% right. I know one of the ones that you talk about is something that's called the Monty <coughs> Hall pro, uh, the Monty Hall problem. He was the host of an old TV show called uh, Let's Make a Deal, where there would be three curtains, a prize behind one of them. Could you explain why the Monty Hall problem haunts, you know, the, the mansion of reason in contemporary America or, or the contemporary world? It's a, de a deceptively simple um, challenge. So there are three doors behind two of them are goats behind one of them is a sleek. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe they, uh, the goats were also sometimes called clunkers. If you, uh, you uh, picked clunkers, wrong. Yes. yes. Yeah. The, uh, and the contestants, uh, uh, challenge is to pick one of the doors. So the, the contestant picks a door, Monty Hall then opens one of the other two doors, always revealing a goat. So he knows what's behind each door. Now the question is, should you switch? That is, should you switch to the unopened door or should you stick with the one that you have? Now, every, almost everyone says either you should um, stick or it doesn't matter, it's 50-50. The correct answer is you should switch, that the odds are two out of three that the car will be behind the uh, unopened door that you didn't pick, one out of three that is behind the door that you did pick. Now, almost everyone, including some of the, the most famous mathematicians of the 20th century get it wrong. It achieved a kind of uh, second uh, notoriety when it was picked up by the columnist Marilyn Beausavant. Right, the smartest the, woman in the world. Yeah, the world's yeah. smartest woman. Yeah, we know that English. because she published every mm -hmm. week in Parade Magazine, the most intellectual publication <laughs> right. on the planet. Uh, uh, that having said, her, her column is really good. Yeah, and yeah, no, it's, it's phenomenal, yeah. And she explained the right answer. And she got thousands of letters um, explaining to her why she was wrong, whereas in fact she was right. Mm -hmm. The uh, the reason that she was right is that when since since Monty Hall knows where uh, the car is located, the fact that he chose a door that he knew did not conceal the car is information. It narrows down the uh, the possibilities. He <clears throat> could have chosen uh, the other door. He did not. That is, doesn't tell you with certainty, but it does mm -hmm. provide you with statistical information that the uh, car might be behind that door. One way that Beau Savant explained it is, imagine that there were say a thousand doors. You pick one, Monty opens 998 of the others, leaving uh, one other one unopened. You would probably pick that door, wouldn't you? Because the fact that he left it unopened is telling you something. He could have opened it, he didn't. Um, but, and it goes to, so it, it yeah, the reason I went through it is, is uh, partly just uh, for the fun of getting people to realize that their first impressions um, 
are often incorrect, including first impressions that are maybe honed by a lot of experience in pointing out other people's fallacies in kind of a gotcha know-it-all mindset that says, oh, that's the gambler's fallacy, just as you shouldn't expect after a run of reds, the next spin should be black, 50-50 uh, red and black. That kind of mindset superficially applied to the Monty Hall, uh, Python, uh, Monty Hall problem, <laughs> yeah, Monty Python, nothing yeah. to do with Monty Python, uh, would say, well, it's 50-50 um, for those two doors. Uh, just based on the kind of superficial analysis that in games of chance, um, the options tend to be equiprobable. These options are not equiprobable because uh, you have information about the two of them and information is critical to probability. And the, the, the final reason that I mentioned it is it also reminds people of the concept of probability is itself um, <clears throat> a, a, kind of a, a multi splendored concept. Uh, it's not clear exactly what probability means. There are different definitions of it, but the one that is relevant to risky decision-making pertains to information. And a, a simple way of explaining the contrast is if I uh, flip a coin and uh, look at it, uh, what is the probability that it landed heads? Well, for you, it's 50%. For me, it's 100%. Now, it's the same coin. It's the same outcome. How could, the, how could there be two different probabilities? And the answer is probability depends on information. It depends on what you know. You know, one of one of this book is obviously uh, one in a series that you've written that really harken back to the Enlightenment and defend the Enlightenment. And so, I think we'll come back to this later in the conversation. But part of part of what you're talking about is that this understanding of rationality, the Sen tribe uses rationality, but when we can take advantage of kind of the codification and you know a deeper understanding of what are the rules that are governing, you know intuitions or, or evolved sensibilities, we can we can be much more precise and much more effective in, in how we think about things. That's right. And, and uh, <clears throat> probably all of my writings uh, in some way deal with human nature uh, as evolution shaped it and the tensions between that and the world that we live in now. And that isn't necessarily, I've moved away from the, the classic conception of that contrast between hunter-gatherers on the savannah and post-agricultural societies. Now that, that is a cleavage, but the more important cleavage, the, the more important um, kind of tug on our intuitions isn't from when we were hunter-gatherers, but simply is everything prior to the uh, contributions of, of the enlightenment of uh, Western educated uh, post-enlightenment societies that have access to data sets, scientific method, tools of reasoning like probability theory, institutions that are dedicated to objective truth. That's what's really novel in human history. And that's what our minds are not quite adapted to. So you don't even have to go all the way back to the Savannah. Just think, do you not accept um, you know, the, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Bayesian reasoning? So, well, let's talk about Bayesian reasoning, because this is something which is really a, an incredible kind of conceptual breakthrough. And I know I have trouble understanding it from, you know, the minute I read it, I'm like, I got it. And then I start to wonder what the hell I just read. Could you talk a little bit about Bayesian, Bayesian reasoning and why it's so uh, important to, uh, to understand? Named after the Reverend Thomas Bayes of the 18th century, um, and who conceptualized um, his main breakthrough, at least conceptual, forget the, the theorem or the formula named after him, which itself is actually not that complicated. But the, the basic idea is you can, if you don't consider your belief to be, uh, yes, I believe it, no, I don't, but a matter of degree, degree of credence, ranging from zero, I'm sure it's false, to one, I'm sure it's true. But for most things that we care about, our belief is somewhere in between. So you can couch it as a probability. Once you do that, then some pretty simple algebra dictates how you should adjust your credence in a belief depending on the strength of the evidence. And there's basically just three, three concepts there's, they go into it. There's the a priori probability, which is actually spilled over into everyday parlance. Recently, more, more and more you hear people talking about your priors. Mm -hmm. That comes from Bayes' theorem. And it's simply, what is, the, uh, what is the credence that you give to an idea based on everything you know so far before you even look at the new data or the new evidence? So that's the prior. Multiply that by the likelihood. And that's just, if the idea is true, how likely are you to see what you're seeing? 
And then you divide that by the commonness of the data, namely, how often do you see those data, whether your idea is true or false, coming summing over the true and false cases. So in the case of a medical test, for example, the false positives would go into that denominator. So just three numbers, but what it, the, the main import, the main thing that people uh, tend to neglect, and this was a contribution of, one of many contributions of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, who are, who are pioneers in a study of human judgment and decision making. So in many circumstances, we forget the prior. They call it base rate neglect. Mm -hmm. You uh, say, talk about a, a disease that's pretty rare in the population. You get a positive test result. There's a non-zero uh, false alarm rate, false positive rate. Do you have the disease? Most people say yes. Often the answer is no, because if the disease is rare to begin with, and there's some false positives, if all you know that is that there's a positive, then it's probably a false positive. That is difficult for us to kind of crunch through uh, in terms of the numbers. Although, and, and this is one of the twists that I add in the book, if instead of talking about saying the prevalence of you know, prostate cancer in the population is 0.01 and the false positive rate of the test is 0.09, you say, uh, imagine 100 men and one of them has prostate cancer. And uh, the, of the men who take the test, nine of them who don't have prostate cancer will nonetheless test positive on this test. You turn it into actual numbers that you can visualize in your mind's eye. Actually, people are, are much, much better at taking into account base rates. And the moral of that story is that it, instead of just dismissing our species as hopelessly irrational, because we do flub tests like medical diagnosis, we, we, a better way to think about it is that the mind is comfortable in certain kinds of formats, certain kinds of um, content, and that it's these formula like Bayes' rule with its uh, H's and D's and a, and a little bit of algebra that we have trouble with. Uh, the power of a formula is you can apply it to anything. You don't have to be familiar with it, but our, our reasoning tends to be baked together with a lot of subject matters and depends on concrete visualizability. So what I'm getting from that is that we should really have all test results revealed by Monty Hall. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, I'm mean. uh, sorry, you've got prostate cancer, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, some of the other uh, kind of problems that you talk about, I think, are, are more familiar to people like um, motivated reasoning and my side bias. Could you talk about my side bias? Because that. You know, certainly, in, you know, if we want to reduce things to partisan politics, which I wish I would never do, but, you know, it happens. But my side bias seems to be a real uh, stumbling block or a real obstacle to employing rationality in a way that will allow us to understand reality better. Indeed, it's been called the most pervasive of the cognitive biases. It's uh, it, uncorrelated with IQ, unlike the other biases and, and fallacies. And this is the the tendency to ratify conclusions that are uh, sacred values or talking points or part of the platform of your own um, tribe, coalition, and sect. And it can lead people, including very smart people, to make errors, you know, blunders in logic 101, in probability 101. They look at data from, a, say, a fake experiment that tries to, to establish whether gun control works or not. And if they're liberals, they, sure enough, the study shows that gun control works, even if the numbers show it doesn't, and vice versa if you're concerned. Right. How do you how do you get around that? I mean, I guess the first step is identifying the propensity for that, but then what are you know what are the ways to kind of understand like to build that into your analysis so that you're not merely ratifying what you already believe? You know, it, it, it can't be done just by drilling the techniques into people's heads because people who know the techniques just um, choose not to apply them when it comes to challenging one of their, their beliefs. So it really does depend on a, a kind of an ethos or a value uh, or a norm that you should doubt your own side's beliefs or at least hold them up to scrutiny, um, be prepared to change your mind. There is a, a, a kind of a, a nerdy clique that tries to promote these values called the rationality community, uh, which I think overlaps with the libertarian movement. Um, but these, these are people who I think uh, to their credit, try to spread these norms, saying, well, you should assign a, problem, a, a degree of credence to your belief instead of saying it's right or wrong. You should uh, think in Bayesian terms uh, intuitively. Uh, you should be prepared to change your mind. 
uh, you should when you're arguing against someone you should uh steel man them right which is the opposite of a straw man mm -hmm. namely build the most formidable effective version of the opinion that you disagree with and try to refute that um one of the uh sections that you talked about or you in in the book that you discussed which i found really interesting was about probability and randomness and kind of you know, confusing one for the other. And in that you were talking about uh, availability inflated fear and particularly murder. And one, you, you talked about the George Floyd murder or killing by, uh, by police in Minnesota, which obviously, you know, changed the political conversation in a way that, you know, exceedingly few events have. And you noted um, that 65 unarmed people are killed each year by police and that I think it was 23 were black. Um, but that, you know, this is an interesting thing where, um, you know, if you look at the data, you would have, you you know, and if we were all Mr. Spock from Star Trek, we would react in one way. Um, but we didn't react that way. And you're saying we shouldn't have reacted that way. But can you kind of tease out how rare events end up becoming kind of um, catalysts for massive kinds of social change uh, and the way that that intersects with your concerns about rationality? Yeah, and it gets back to the point that rationality is always in service of a goal. And if the uh, if the goal is to probably to you know save the largest number of black lives or, or anyone's lives who, who are uh, killed by police, then um, basing it on a viral video is probably not the, the way to go. That they, that you should go to the Washington Post data data set and look at how many uh, are killed, and then compare it to how many people are killed from. Um, gang warfare and street crime where you know if you, if you hobble the police you might actually uh, increase the number of people who have, of all races who are killed which is in fact exactly what happened but there's another um goal that you could pursue and again you can't say it's irrational because it's a different goal and it's irrational to pursue that goal it's how do you mobilize people uh for some social or political crusade that uh, up to then they may have been apathetic about well a what thomas Schelling he didn't call it that but he identified a uh, communal outrage, and John Tooby and Lita Cosmides have also written about this, that is a conspicuous event that is perceived as an intolerable affront to your tribe or group that not only do you uh, know about, but you know that everyone else knows about it at the same time. And they can be very effective for, for better or worse in uh, mobilizing collective action as people respond to that collective outrage. And other examples, so the George Floyd murder was uh, certainly an example. Other examples are the Tunisian uh, fruit peddler who set himself on fire and catalyzed the Arab Spring. 9-11, which led to, we're still, still dealing with the, uh, the, the sequelae, including the fact that it was probably the invasion of Afghanistan. I mean, retroactively, it was seen as trying to impose liberal democracy on this tribal society. But really, it was just, um, you know, kind of, uh, there was such outrage at this attack it was basically saying, you know, don't fuck with us. You, you, you hurt us, we're going to hurt you. Uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, the explosion of the Maine, the, the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, you can, you, uh, leaders who say never let a crisis go to waste can use a conspicuous outrage. How does, you know, you mentioned the Gulf of Tonkin, which you know, historians now question uh whether or not that incident actually ever happened. And, you know, there are other, and that's, it's not a conspiracy view. It's, you know, there's, there's a, a real question about whether or not the, the incident that kind of led to this in massive increase of U.S. presence in Vietnam. How do you tease that kind of stuff out? Or, you know, is that only something that can be done after the fact? Or, you know, how would we, if we're trying to use rationality to kind of keep our best society and our best selves going, how do how do we check that in that in particularly in the heat of the moment? Yeah, and that it's, it, it, it is a challenge because there is you know, some legitimate rationale for not exposing everything in uh, uh, intelligence government to the not publishing it on the front page of the New York Times the day that it happens. Uh, on the other hand, in a democracy, people ultimately have to know what the government is doing and, and what it's reacting to. So um, yeah, I think there's no simple answer to how, to how to balance those, but you know, in general, I think you and I would agree, and probably most people listening, that it should be tilted as much as possible to access that government should not be allowed to you know, get away with, with uh, shenanigans. 
Yeah, and especially, I mean, I guess this also, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the question of conspiracy theory uh, and also whether or not is is irrationality or non-rationality getting, or is rationality getting scarcer? You say that it's scarce, um, but you know, if you if you start from say the Vietnam War in an American context, there's been a massive decline in trust and confidence, not just in government, but also in business, in uh, kind of uh, nonprofit sectors, including things like the Catholic Church or the United Way. And so we, you know, as kind of trust and confidence continues to decline, people seem less likely to believe what they're told anyway. Um, so you know. It's, are we in a are we in a golden age of conspiracy thinking and of magical thinking, or is it really kind of a steady state um, that just comes with being human? Yeah, I think there it, there is a, a steady state, and and uh, conspiracy theories go go way back, yeah. uh, even just a century ago, the protocols of the elders of Zion and the Illuminati and. Uh, the, the Freemasons. Well, the Illuminati are true, though. I, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Action Bronson, the Albanian American rapper, has you know believes in it, so I do too. <laughs> yeah, and as best we can tell, you know, and it's, it's hard to plot these things quantitatively. And I always resist the leap from "there's a lot of stuff now, therefore it's getting yeah. worse," because often that's not true. Right. And there is one guy who tried to quantify it, Joseph Yashinsky, in his book on conspiracy thinking theory, theorizing. And so he, he tried to find a data set where you could actually measure it that goes back. And he found, so he looked at a trove of letters to the editor, I think of, of the Times, and he found at least through 2010, there was a pretty <laughs> constant level of conspiracy theorizing. Yeah. By the way, trusted institutions, you're right that, that they have sunk in, in most institutions um, uh, since the 60s. But we should also keep in mind the fact that John Mueller has pointed out, which is that 60s were kind of a high point uh, that we've they were kind of a peak in that before that, um, people didn't trust the, the government either. Um, so that may be also close to a, a steady background state. Yeah, John Mueller is also uh, just has been great in kind of really documenting the amount of, of hype over terrorist killing or terrorist violence in America and things like that. It's a really, um, uh, you know, I, I think he fulfills most of your uh, requests for more analytic uh, analytic approaches and rational approaches to everyday life, for sure. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about uh, why any of this matters. Um, you know, and it seems I hesitate to, you know, say like, you know, why, why should we be more rational uh, or why should we avail ourselves or our rationality? Can you, you know, why are, are we actually in a situation where we need to be doing that? Um, but, you know, yes or no. And then, you know, why, what is, what's the main case for in, increasing the volume and kind of quality of our rational uh, behavior? Yeah. And again, it, it is a paradoxical challenge because uh, the only way that I can defend rationality is by using rationality, which itself is an argument that we're already committed to rationality if we're having this conversation in the first place. <laughs> because you know, you're not you're not offering me a bribe as to uh, you're not asking me to bribe your listeners and saying if you uh, I'll, I'll send you a twenty five dollar Amazon gift certificate if you agree with me. Uh, I'm giving reasons, which means you're already committed to reason. So there's that kind of inescapable background that we uh, uh, it, it's the air we breathe. What what is the alternative though to rationality? Is it is it just kind of a, a Nietzschean will to power or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's one of the primary alternatives. There's the the idea that we, you should go with your gut. There's wisdom in uh, inarticulate first reactions, uh, in uh, and this overlaps a bit with with uh, Nietzsche that uh, um, it was it, important is not to think but to feel. I think it was a, a Herder, uh, the, the mm -hmm. German romantic, who, who said that, uh, or that there's there is no and this. It, it, it's tied to, to Nietzscheism, but but it's um, quite part of social justice warfare, wokeism, the successor ideology, as Wesley Yang put it, which is that objective uh, truth is an illusion. It's just a, a claim to power. There is a zero-sum competition among uh, interest groups defined by race and sex, and argumentation should be to rectify the power imbalance where it's been the straight white males who've had all the power. Is and, there a uh, way, I mean, can you use rationality to, uh, you know, to say, no, uh, in fact, you, we can at least aspire to disinterested 
a, a disinterested understanding of the world, uh, which will allow us to have a fairer and ju more just world. Or, I mean, when people say, well, you know what, like, you know, talking about the Enlightenment, that's just the way to disguise your will to power and to make it, you know, to make it complicated so it seems legitimate. But in fact, yeah, I get that all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, so I well, mean, in a, in a way, I mean, these are kind of incommensurate arguments. And in a way, they are that you, uh, if, if you believe that our argument itself is just a subterfuge, then you're not going to be open to any argument to change your mind. Nonetheless, I think there is there's a little chink, a little o opening, which is, you know, so are you willing to say that uh, everything you just said now is um, irrational? Uh, and and if so, why should I why should I believe it? Why should I support you? Uh, are there any reasons? And as soon as they say, well, yeah, there are reasons. Aha, <laughs> you, yeah. you believe in, in, in reason after all. Right. Now, of course, human nature being what it is, people don't lay down their, their tribal commitments uh, at the drop of a hat. But on the other hand, onlookers might uh, be persuaded one, one way or another. New, new babies are being born every minute. And they've got to acquire a, a worldview. But let me, uh, I also just want to take it beyond the, uh, the kind of the foundational answer, which is that as long as you're discussing reasons for anything, you're already committed to reason. Getting back to your question, why does uh, reason and rationality matter? So that, that's, that's one obvious kind of meta reason. Another is that um, in fact, there are some data that suggest that people who are less susceptible to some of the classic fallacies like the gambler's fallacy, the sunk cost fallacy and so on, have better life outcomes. They're less likely to get sick, to miss a train, to uh, get fired, uh, to get divorced. There's um, uh, getting back to the uh, to the to the uh, causes of progress. Um, progress being a demonstrable empirical fact, namely we live longer, we're we're uh, we're richer, we're better educated, we're we're happier. How did that happen? Well, not no thanks to the universe, where the laws of, of physics and, and biology uh, try to grind us down. Uh, the only way that we can possibly carve out a better life for ourselves is by right. applying reason, applying our brain power to make us better off. Mm -hmm. And I suggest somewhat, um, uh, maybe a bit tenuously, that the social movements that have succeeded and that should have succeeded often began with an argument. There was a, a John Locke, there was a, an Adam Smith, there was a Mary Astell, there was a, a, um, a Cesare Beccaria, who articulated why some practice of the day was inconsistent with other values that people held. And it would go viral in pamphlets, in a kind of samus of the day, be debated in pubs and salons and coffee houses, and, and eventually become the uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, yeah, and that uh, that's a fascinating section. And you talk about somebody like Frederick Douglass. Uh, there were also a number of uh, early feminists who took you know, Lockean logic or the logic of the Declaration of Independence and then used it to actually expand the rights of, you know, to the, expand the circle of who counted as human, who counted full rights. Um, how um, is, do you think reason alone or rationality alone is compelling? Because and I, I think about something like the abolitionist movement, there were absolute arguments which employed kind of um, uh, religious reasoning that we are all equal before God, so no one should, uh, you know, rule over one of us. Uh, taking saying that blacks are humans just as whites are, but then there was also famous images which seem to be more uh, uh, um, geared towards the emotion. So the the famous image of the slave ship and the way that the slaves were actually put in the uh, you know in the holds of ships, by all accounts, had a massive impact. Um, so is reason one of the tools, or is it you know is it is it necessary? Is it sufficient? How do you, when you're trying to persuade people to a particular point of view or a, a vision of the of the good life? No, it's it's a really good point because we are we are humans. We're driven not just by abstract principles of human rights and human equality, but by empathy, by uh, by horror, by disgust, by uh, compassion. Which you know, and, and those are emotions and and an effective persuader knows how to, to use both. And Frederick Douglass being a, a fine example, yeah. he had a you know, just a lightning sharp mind and he kept saying, I'm not gonna argue why slavery is <laughs> evil. Then he provoked you know, 17 yeah. arguments. Yeah, yeah. But, and he also appealed to heart-wrenching images of right. the uh, suffering of slaves, yeah.
this sounds like a good place to ask you. Uh, I want to I want to ask you two uh, questions here to explain one thing. You, you in in the book you uh, mentioned in passing the famous Hume line about how reason is and always should be a, a slave to the passions. Can you explain what he's actually getting there? Because um, sometimes I think that leaves people wondering what the hell to think about. <laughs> yes, right. You know, it's easy to misinterpret him as saying that we should just. Uh, you know, kind of uh, shoot from the hip, uh, reason by the seat of our pants, uh, succumb to temptations of the moment. But he of all people was not saying that. I think ultimately it's the logical point that uh, it, it, reason is in service of a goal and it can't tell you what that goal should be. And the goal in, in practice in humans is provided by the passions, by the emotions. We deploy our reason to uh, attain something that we want and, and who's to say what we want, that, those are passions. So does that, I mean, it, does it get us that far from a kind of medieval conception of man as a, uh, you know, an angel trapped in the, the body of a beast? <laughs> yeah, um, well, it, it is, you know, and I, I did a, a, a appeal to an angelic metaphor in my mm -hmm. book on the decline of violence, right. the better angels of our nature. And I do think as, as someone who's an advocate, both of the idea that there is such a thing as human nature, and as an advocate of the belief that progress is possible, so you can't just say, oh, you can't change human nature. We're stuck with war because it's in our genes. I don't believe that. Just because the, the mind does have uh, multiple systems, multiple components, multiple uh, 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 modules, if you want. And we, there's a, always tension between various desires, various better angels. And it's by kind of uh, mobilizing and empowering our, our better angels, so to speak, that, that progress is possible. So there is something Notion, yeah. I want to ask you about uh, Rebel Without a Cause. The I think it's a 1954 movie or 1955, but right around the time you were born, uh, it's obviously a famous movie of, uh, starring James Dean. Um, you use that to illustrate a couple of uh, points, but uh, can you talk about how the uh, the chicken run, where the you know the two uh, two characters are going to drive cars straight at each other? Um, how does that how does that illustrate rationality for you? Yeah. And then also, I mean, why do you love that movie so much? <laughs> uh, in fact, in the movie, they, they, I, I, I had to remind myself they didn't actually approach each other. The uh -huh. chicken there was driving over a cliff. Right, right. Uh, but the the idea is that the uh, let, let's take a simpler case of the two cars approaching each other right. at high speed, each driven by a teenager. The first to swerve. Is the chicken? He loses right. space. He loses. Yeah. Um, the uh, it's an illustration of a game theory uh, paradox in which um, often the optimal strategy in situations of, of conflict is to be less rational, less in control. In this case, how do you win a chicken? Well, you you, you put a U lock on the steering wheel, you put a brick on the accelerator, you climb into the back seat. The other guy has no choice but to swerve. So the guy who sacrifice, who visibly sacrifices control, uh, is the one who wins. Now, of course, the problem is if both teenagers hit on the strategy at the same time, it could be a recipe for disaster. Yeah, we are talking about teenagers, so the likelihood of that is probably higher than it is among people of a uh, more uh, more mature age. Yeah, exactly. And of course, in in situations where the winner is the less rational one. What's the higher level rationality is don't play games like that or right. don't, don't deal with the hothead, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, high maintenance partner, the unreasonable person, because you know, they are going to win. And so find someone else to, to negotiate with. Can I ask about uh, I, I, one of the reasons that we're with uh, Rebel Without a Cause uh, is that you know that also kind of created a different um, sensibility among a lot of American uh, you know I guess global or North American teenagers is uh, you know and, and it created a sense of what what it was to be an adolescent. People ape James Dean. I mean they're still doing it in various ways. Is it? Conceivable that for something like rationality, that if you have maybe artistic works or you know large movements that suddenly make it cool to be rational, um, is that a way of kind of changing the grounds upon which we stand? Because uh, you know um, your argument is that it's better to have more rational, more rational actors in a society than fewer. Um, is that one of the ways to kind of build out the volume and the quality of of rationality in society? Yeah, could you have a, a rational James Dean? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It'd be a tall order. I mean, it's hard to engineer yeah. any kind of grassroots cultural change from, from, the, from the top. But, down. but I mean, it kind of comes and goes in streaks, right? Where, uh, does, you know, yeah. in, in the Enlightenment, certainly there were movements where it was kind of, you know, it was cool. I, although maybe not at the time, but looking backwards, we categorize it as, you know, the certain salons, certain, um, you know, yeah. areas of Paris and, and Edinburgh and whatnot. Yeah. And that there is a, a kind of uh, Silicon Valley rationality community, Bay Area that, that, Kind of tries to do that. I don't know if they uh, succeed in breaking out of the, the nerd stereotype. Right. But it, the, the thing to capitalize on probably is not how cool it is to be rational, but maybe how uncool it is to be irrational, to be caught in making a, an ob obvious blunder. So it might have to come from that side. At one point, you uh, you mentioned in passing the uh, I wrote it down here. I believe it's uh, univ that universities have a suffocating left wing monoculture. Um, one would expect that universities would be the first place to kind of be pushing rational uh, rational discourse. What do you think explains the evacuation of rationality from universities, and what is the best way to kind of try and bring it back to these places where that seems to be the whole point um, and certainly was, you know, at least the origin story of universities. I think that, that um, everyone is tempted by uh, a goal that is not the same as the goal of pursuing objective truth, of um, being on the uh, side of a um, prestigious coalition. And we all have a, a Kind of acute antennae for which way the coalitions are forming, a terror of being on the in a minority coalition. Um, and so it is a kind of herd mentality that no one is immune to. As a kind of uh, a, a, a paradoxical byproduct of some of the progress that we've made, namely racism really has gone down and right. sexual harassment and, and um, uh, 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 sexism and so on. It creates an opening for uh, a moralistic crusade in which you can be on the side of the angels and you can uh, uh, and do your darndest not to be on the on the receiving end of the moral uh, indignation. That's a game that that got uh, uh, it, it. It didn't begin in, in the the, uh, the last decade or so. It's uh, I remember it from when I was an undergraduate. It had already begun the idea that academics are some kind of moral beacons, uh, and that beacon consi really consisting of condemning uh, the, the, the heretics and the, the, uh, the, the reprobates, um, the, the attacks on E.O. Wilson, the biologist, by his Harvard colleagues, um, uh, Richard Lewinton and Stephen Jay Gould were an early example of that. And I, don't, I wouldn't have predicted that it would become kind of the dominant uh, ethos of the university, finding bad people to demonized. It's kind of interesting, by the way, just to uh, stop on that for a second, that that really started in the sciences, because oftentimes kind of political uh, moralizing or ideological moralizing is seen as something that, uh, you know, starts and stops in the humanities and social sciences. That, that is interesting. Yeah. And uh, John, John Haidt has been most explicit in saying that, that universities really have to choose whether their telos is finding, uh, is advancing knowledge or advancing some political cause, in this case, social justice defined as relative standing among groups, uh, that, that, that you can't do both because reality is going to sometimes confound your moralistic narrative. Can I ask you, you know, just as a bit of biography, I mean, you uh, somewhat famously grew up in a Jewish section of Montreal or of Canada. Um, which kind of makes you an outsider with, I mean, if you're English speaking in, in Quebec, you're already an outsider. And then if you're not part of the kind of Anglo, uh, uh, Anglo, um, Canadian, uh, establishment and whatnot. But do you think that there's anything in your biography that kind of, um, you know, pre predisposes you to being comfortable speaking in a, from a minority point of view or going against that herd mentality that you talk about, or is that, you know, I, how, do, how do we develop that in people who maybe, you know, wouldn't necessarily uh, have been raised in that kind of context? Yeah, it, it's possible. Um, I think I've also been uh, kind of practical and, and, uh, and mindful of what I can, um, what I can get away with without just um, being canceled and vanishing into uh, obscurity that I've taken advantage of this peculiar custom of uh, tenure and have been more outspoken when I know that I wouldn't 
kind of lose my livelihood for saying unpopular things. Uh, it's, uh, I think having the, uh, coming from uh, social sciences with just a mindset that it, deep, interesting ideas about politics, human nature, meaning of life, um, uh, can be and ought to be shaped by, by uh, empirical observations, by data. It's that overriding mindset that I, that I like to think um, that motivates me in, in the, these other questions. One of the, uh, in the final section of your book, when you're talking about why it matters, um, you, you, def you, you say that rationality is a public good. Um, and you use Wikipedia as an example of how in a kind of public sphere of debate and discussion, we can, we can use rationality, but also uh, as you stress throughout the book and you've said today, um, you know, you need to be able to constantly be checking your bias or to make sure that you're not baking in your own, uh, you know, my side bias or confirmation bias or motivated reasoning. How does Wikipedia work as a kind of good way of cre producing knowledge, but also kind of checking to make sure that people aren't just kind of you know, going down a rabbit hole of just so stories that, um, you know, validate whatever their priors were. Yeah, it's, it's come as a surprise to almost everyone how good Wikipedia is. Certainly in its early years, uh, I and, and most people say this, this can't possibly work. You have an encyclopedia. Where it's the can... online encyclopedia that anyone can edit, right? What a disaster. What a disaster. And in the yeah. early years, it was a disaster. I mean, the articles in the, in the first couple of years were, were uh, uh, embarrassing. But it... Um, so it did implement a set of rules of checks and balances under the overarching uh, ethos or telos, if you want to use fancy words, of objectivity and, and truth. That's, there, there are five pillars of Wikipedia. These are principles that all the Wikipedians sign on to. And uh, foremost among them is, uh, is, is uh, accuracy and objective truth. So there's the overall commitment, and then there are the mechanisms where one person doesn't get to bang his drum or, or, or ride his hobby horse. Yeah, if he or she does, more often he, then someone else with a different hobby horse will um, uh, erase that edit. Uh, it doesn't always work, but of course the Britannica didn't always work either. Right. Um, and it is, what it shows is that it isn't that digital media are inherently um, kind of, you know, cesspools of, of uh, fake news. It depends on, on the rules of the game. and. Uh, again, uh, yet another lesson is that you can't predict a priori what is going to work. You have, you have to see how things unfold and, and measure their, their accuracy. At the beginning of social media, a lot of people thought that this would be a, a, a birth of new enlightenment because, you know, at the time, and you and I are old enough to remember where when they, the problem with the press is, uh, as they used to say, freedom of the press um, goes with the, the, those who own one. And you had you know, Noam Chomsky with manufacturing consent and an oligarchy of a small number of corporations. And what we really need is that anyone could publish. Well, we, we got what we asked for. Yeah. Um, so are you, I guess, uh, to kind of uh, end the conversation, are you optimistic about the ability for you know people to generate rules of the game and obviously there's going to be many kind of scenario or many areas that people are doing this and they're going to be overlapping and oft oftentimes contradict themselves or different groups i mean th this is part of the enlightenment right it's really a process it's not it's not a threshold that you cr you cross or a plateau that you reach um are you optimistic that we're going to get better at kind of uh creating the institutions and the norms that will make us be more rational, which will lead to more progress and also kind of better um, social amity. Yeah, I think it'll be, uh, as someone who believes in human nature, I don't think we'll ever have a, a, an epistemic utopia. I think there'll always be conspiracy theories and, and fake news. Will our institutions um, uh, kind of develop the right workarounds or, or better ones? It'll probably vary by country that um, uh, the mechanisms of democracy we know can promote or, or demote. Um, uh, data-driven decision-making, different institutions will succeed or fail. Uh, the, the fact that and so many people are aware of the hazards means that there is some hope that we'll develop some, some workarounds, um, but there'll, there'll always be some amount of uh, chaos and, and a background hubbub of nonsense. Do you have, as a final question, do you have a particularly uh, embarrassing belief that is obviously not rational? Uh, 
Well, I guess if, 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 if <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to judge because we all are subject to bias bias. All of us think that everyone else is biased, uh, but, but not me. Uh, and it's like the, uh, the, the preface paradox. You open a book and every preface says, remaining errors are my fault. And you say, well, why don't you correct them? And of course the answer is, I don't know which ones they are. And it's not yet. Uh, so you, you don't have any irrational beliefs. You, you don't believe in UFOs or uh, oh, vitamin oh, C yeah. therapy or anything like I don't, that. I, 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 don't, I don't have any uh, fringe beliefs, although some might say that, <laughs> that uh, a belief that progress has taken place is a fringe belief. Yeah, that's a that's a strange one. I guess just as a final final question, uh, at some point I know over the years we've talked about Bob Dylan and we both admire him greatly. Um, how uh, how excited were you when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature? You know, uh, as much of a Dylan fan as I am, I actually was not kind of down with that decision just because there's already such fame and rewards and notoriety to to, to you know, popular musicians. Whereas literature is a, 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 a tougher game and something that is designed to amplify you know, those guys, uh, I, I think would have been better suited. Maybe we need a different kind of prize, uh, but I, it would have been nice, I think, if a, a novelist gained greater fame through, through an allocation of that I prize. guess he, he himself was ambivalent about it, right? Because it took him a couple of weeks or a month to get back to the committee, so. Oh, he'd have to be. If he yeah. wasn't there, he wouldn't be Dylan. <laughs> oh my God, he immediately said, thank you, this is the honor of my life. He'd, he'd say, oh my God, what happened to Bob Dylan? Yeah, I was I was kind of hoping he'd join Sartre uh, to, and, in rejecting it, but uh, you know, Dylan, Dylan never fully satisfies his audience, so that's part of what makes him great. And, and, and that's crucial, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're going to leave it there. Stephen Pinker, author most recently of Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters. Thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick. Always a pleasure. And, and it's certainly fitting that this interview be for a site called Reason. Yeah. <laughs>